What if I could tell you a technique that would make you more attractive, increase your confidence, and decrease your stress levels? I know what you're thinking. It's not a glass of wine. <laughs> it's a smile. Smiling has been shown to decrease your blood pressure, boost your immune system, and release mood-lifting endorphins. What a fascinating ability we possess. As Leo Biscaglia once said, we often underestimate the power of a touch, a smile. As a child, I was always fascinated with my teeth. Brushing a knight was like a religious ceremony. It was a obsession. But for me, I was always perplexed when other people didn't feel the same way. And I was that annoying little brother in the bathroom lecturing my sister when she was probably saying, you're not doing it right. You, you, you're just sucking on That's not doing anything. Mum, tell her to stop daydreaming. She never listened. So you can imagine how validated I felt at our first dental treat, dental, when she was sitting in the chair, and she put, pushed back in the chair and opened her mouth, and I saw a hole so big that I thought I could shoot a basketball into it. <laughs> My poor sister learned the hard way, and I told her so. <laughs> that was my first experience with dental disease, but it wouldn't be my last. After graduating from dental school, I felt more equipped to tackle people's disinterest in their teeth. Little did I know, it would be a little bit more of a challenge than I had anticipated. At dinner parties, you introduce yourself and people say, so Stephen, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a dentist. And they go, oh, <laughs> I hate the dentist. <laughs> Let's go and sit with the accountants and lawyers. <laughs> Now, there's a surefire sign that you're not winning any popularity contests. But it's true that people have issues with the dentist. I remember when I met Jenny. Jenny was a mother of three. She came into, the, came into the, um, the, for an appointment, and she said, I've had this terrible toothache all day. I said, well, don't worry, Jenny, we're here to help you. And she said, oh, I've put it off, but it's just so painful now. And I, I said, well, we're going to go very slowly. You know, we do this every day. And she said, I... I'd rather give birth than have dental treatment. <laughs> you, you what? Now, let's think about that for a second. Now, you've got two options. Okay, all right, well, option number one. Well, okay, you're going to have an idiot dental filling. All right, okay, so might be a bit sore for a few days. So what's option number two? Well, you're going to have a small human pass through your pelvis. Now, I, I'll take option number one. I mean, come on. They're not on the same level. We're blowing things out of perspective. I mean, I can't comment personally, but think of the watermelon and the golf ball analogies. But... <laughs> but it's true that people suffer more than disinterest in their teeth. People, people fear the dentist and dental treatment. Why? Why did Jenny feel like this? Well, as organisms, we evolved pain receptors as a survival mechanism. The hands have a very high concentration of pain receptors so that when we reach out and touch something such as a hot surface, we recoil immediately. The same is true for the, as the, same is true for the mouth where we have a complex network of taste and pain sensation that allows us to detect dangerous substances before we swallow them. Now pain pathways are interpreted and superimposed onto different parts of the brain that deal with memory, attention and emotion. So this is why we build up painful memories and, and why we have feelings and emotions associated with dental treatment. Now, see this happy little fellow? That's a pedal-powered dental drill. Oh, can, can you... Um, you'd have to warm that thing up. Your grandparents, or maybe even parents, may be able to tell you stories about these. It wasn't until 1957 the, the, we introduced the air turbine drill handpiece that we know as the dental drill. So we didn't exactly nail the best way to deal with this very sensitive part of the body. And as a result, modern dentistry carries a stigma. And this stigma results in dental avoidance. Now I think we can get a snippet of dental avoidance right here in this room today. We're going to take a survey, so I want everyone to raise their hand who flosses once a day. Okay. 
And now, this question is also known as the dental lie detector. So we're going to be checking people on the way out after. So, yeah. So not so, yeah. But let's have a look. Okay, so less than half. Women more than men. Yep. Look at the men up the back. They're going, flossing. I'm like, forget about that. Flossing, mate. Mate, just be happy if I'm brushing, all right? But, well, what if I were to tell you that flossing removes 35% that of plaque that builds up on your teeth and gums, and then if left over the long term, increases your risk of gum disease. Now, gum disease has been shown to be linked through vascular dysfunction to male impotency. Hmm. <laughs> Erectile dysfunction. Oh. She said, better get some floss. <laughs> and ladies, and take note of the hands. <laughs> It's true that when we understand the implications of something, it becomes important to us. I believe that we've missed out in society of, of communicating the importance of dental health. I remember I'd met Norman, was a, was a patient that stuck out in my head. Norman was a very jovial character. He walked in for an appointment, loved a joke. Didn't have many teeth, Norman. Walked in. He pointed one tooth down the back. He said, see that tooth? Said, yeah, Norman. He said, that's me chewing tooth. I said, all right. <laughs> And he said, see this tooth is a lone standing front tooth. I said, yeah. He said, that one's for the ladies. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Norman, Norman attend, attended the appointment with his wife, but his wife wasn't in such, such a happy mood. She, Norman was actually referred by his, his cardiologist. Now, he was actually in need of, of quadruple bypass heart surgery, and in order to get the operation, he needed a dental clearance. So after his examination, we found that Norman had severe gum disease, and then because of the urgency of the surgery, we, we needed to take out his remaining teeth with a plan to, to make a denture once he recovered from the operation. Now, if you think of Norman's gums, the surface area of, like mine and yours, of your gums equal the same surface area as the whole skin of your forearm. So you can imagine in gum disease, we have a chronic inflammation process occurring. Now, you can imagine this happening on the entire skin of your forearm. It's going to put a lot of pressure on your body. In fact, 91% of people with heart disease also have gum disease, as compared to 66% of those in the normal population. Now, Norman's wife returned three months later to the surgery and tragically informed us that Norman had experienced complications with his surgery and has sadly passed away. Now, the frustrating part of this story is that by the time I'd seen Norman, it was too late. The disease process had occurred in his mouth over his lifetime. Now, gum disease is linked to a broad spectrum of diseases that include stroke, diabetes, preterm low birth rate, life-threatening diseases. Why aren't we acknowledging this? Why did Norman's condition get so bad? Why will only a handful of people in this audience today floss once a day? And why will nearly half of Australian kids get tooth decay by age six? I believe to answer this question, we need to see and understand how oral health fits into our society and our healthcare system. The dental community are the holders of, holders of oral health education and knowledge, but we're not very good at communicating it. And if you think about the stigma and avoidance associated with dental care, this makes sense. And coupled with, with, with a, a lack of service and access, in practical terms we see one in five Australians avoiding going to the dentist compared to one in 25 going to the doctor. Now, we are a community that are locked off from education and we are also locked off from services. So what other, what other factor affects this system? Well, in a healthy system, the government invests into infrastructure and access to make a flowing interactive community between, between the dental community and the public. This is what our system looks like. This is the system that Norman, Jenny, everyone in this room, my sister, and, and our children will grow up in. One strangled by costs 
miscommunication and high disease. We are a public that don't understand the importance of dental disease, so we don't communicate it to the government to incentivise them to invest into services. 90% of, of dental disease is preventable by simple, modifiable habits. What if everyone had that annoying brother in the bathroom nagging them to brush all the time? What about a nice, help, friendly help, health professional that understands how important your oral health is and what exactly you need to do to look after it? The key to breaking this cycle and, break, and, and creating a culture of oral health in our society is to unlock dental communication to spread knowledge and information so that we feel that dental health and our oral health is important for our lives and well-being. We live in a society that uses technology more for banking, online shopping and ordering a taxi more than we do for our health. Here we have an opportunity, digital health, the use of technology to streamline our healthcare processes. How does this apply to our oral health system? Well, e-health, the use of online information and technology to boost, to boost our dental IQs. M-health, mobile, mobile applications that create communication interfaces between health professionals and their patient bases. Healthcare social media, discuss, building discussion and communication around issues before they become a problem. At Dental Hub, we're building a crowdsource information platform that teaches and activates dental professionals to be better communicators. We're developing an app to create a commu communication stream from, from your dental professional directly to your mobile app. Through education, we can, we can empower people to feel why oral health is important to their life and, and integrate it into their culture and lifestyles. If nine out of ten of your friends raise their hand to the flossing question, and you knew that by not doing it, you would increase your risk of heart disease and maybe impotency, would you take the risk? It's community conversations and cultures like this that create swells that incentivizes the government to invest into infrastructure and access and services to those who cannot afford it. Through education and communication, and integrating technology into our healthcare processes, we, we can transform our paradigm of oral health from a reactive, one of reactive treatment to one of prevention, understanding and education. I hope that everyone here today gets the opportunity to feel the power of a smile in every day of their life. Our mouths truly are the gateway to, to the human experience. I also hope the UC or how society puts oral health to the side of our lives and well-being, and how our healthcare system does the same. Here, we have an opportunity to break new grounds in our knowledge of lives and our well-being and health, but also to drag our healthcare system out of the dark ages and into a progressive 21st century. 21st century. <laughs> So the next time you scoff at flossing, please think of me. <laughs> if not me, think of yourself. If not yourself, think of your partner. <laughs> but if not your partner, think of your children. Thank you. <laughs>